This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Small Mouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Hello, welcome to the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. And here it is, another week talking to some of the best smallmouth anglers in North America. These guys know how to catch big, big smallmouth. Such great information. I mean, I'm blown away. I know you guys are enjoying the show. I want to thank the the listeners on the podcast platform, as well as the viewers on the YouTube channel, Smallmouth Crush. Certainly appreciate the support. Before we bring on our next guest, let's talk about the real shot. Of course, the Real Shots been sponsoring this podcast all season. They have all the most wanted bass tackle that a smallmouth crush fan could ask for. Top brands like Mega Bass, Jackal, Evergreen, Z-Man, Daiwa, Shimano, Dirty Jigs, Omega, Kitex, St. Croix Rods. You name it, they got it all. Easy to shop website, same day shipping. They'll help make sure you get that product in your tackle box before your next tournament or your big bass fishing adventure. TheRealShot.com, use my promo code SMALLMOUTHCRUSH, and you're going to get 15% off your first order. So definitely want to take advantage of that and check it out. Well, let's bring our next guest, Canadian. Lenny, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. Travis, yourself? I'm doing great, man. I'm, I'm really excited to get in your head when it comes to big smallmouth because you certainly know how to catch them. Um, so much to talk about. Hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be able to get a little bit better understanding of what makes you, um, you know, so well adapted out there when you're, when you're fishing for smallmouth. But before we go there and get into some of the questions, if you could just do a quick little introduction of about yourself, your background and kind of where you're at today, uh, in terms of, of fishing. Absolutely. Uh, well, I was born and raised in, uh, Kingston. Uh, which is which you know is uh, right beside the St. Lawrence River, Lake Ontario. Uh, pretty incredible fishing for any species you want. Um, I've always lived uh, within half an hour of the city. Um, I, I love it here. Uh, I, the, the main reason I stay is because of the fishing. I, right. I can't lie. But uh, I'm fortunate enough to be a firefighter for the city of Kingston, so it allows me to get on the water quite a bit. And, been fishing tournaments for probably close to 30 years now, but fished all my life. So it's a great, great spot to be. Yeah, it is an amazing place to fish for smallmouth. Have you have you ventured out? Uh, have, you, have you been to the States in certain bodies of water? Uh, what's Where's your you know experience when it comes to smallmouth fishing? Uh, is it primarily on Ontario on the St. Lawrence River? Yeah, like... Uh, a few friends of mine are always wondering why I don't venture away and fish elsewhere, but I really haven't opened up every door on Lake Ontario yet. So I got a lot to explore and the fishing is so good. I really don't have a whole lot of reasons to leave. I so, can't blame and you. The St. Lawrence river. I mean, that's, that's 20 years worth of trying to find fish in Lake Ontario. God, that's, that's even more. So I had a lot of avenues I got open here yet first. No, that's interesting. You know, uh, it's a special place. Uh, it, it's one of my favorite places in the country to fish. I mean, it's got a great population of everything. For those that are not familiar, Lake Ontario, the St. Lawrence River, it, it's it's always rated, you know, one of the top destinations for smallmouth fishing. It it deserves to be on the list in any type of uh, any type of reference to some of the best places in the in the country to fish. But it has a, uh, just an amazing population of every game fish, and it's such a beautiful area. I mean, that's what I love about it. It's just it's very scenic, and there's so many different options, and of course, crystal clear water at times, and big smallmouth bass, no doubt. So, not wanting to venture out from there, I got to ask you what what what's left to explore? Oh, there's just. Uh... Well, as you know, Lake Ontario, is, it's a massive, massive body of water. So weather protects that fishery. Weather protects me from getting out there every time I want to. Um, if it wasn't for the weather, it might not be the fishery that it is. 
picking your days. Uh, every year I try to take a section of the lake and dissect it. And it'll take me all summer to dissect the 10, 15 mile radius. So every year I try to venture to that different area just to try to figure things out. Wow. You know, and the, those days where it's blowing, I, I go down the river and do the same thing. So That's a very good point. So every year you decide you want to explore a new area and really focus in on that. So whether it be the big lake, and of course, if you got a, a day when it's blowing and you, you get to go fishing and it's just not safe or it doesn't make sense, you're going to focus in a certain part of the river. I'm sure you got your, your go-to fun places, places that are historically, you know, holds fish. But I love the fact that you're going you're gonna to put that as far as a game plan every year to try to learn it even more. Uh, I think that's important. What have you found by, by using that approach over the years? Has, has a lot of it worked out? Is there a lot of times where you, you focus in on an area and you just realize, you know, maybe the population isn't there or do you, do you always find something special? Well, definitely, uh, I would say the results have probably been more negative than has positive in certain areas. But that's that's part of figuring things out. You, you eliminate a lot of water by doing it. Yeah, but on the same note, I found some pretty incredible spots, which you got to figure out, okay, now is it just this time of year that they're there or are they just there because of bait fish uh, and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of variables when you do find something and, and you just want to make sure it's consistent for that time period you need it. So. I guess we can ask this question. If you had to tell me what your favorite technique when it comes to smallmouth fishing, what would that be? Oh, that's a tough one. There's a, I, I would call it, can I say, can I give you two? There's Absolutely. A yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's your top two? Um, definitely a tube jig is definitely my favorite. Um, probably 80% of the biggest smallmouth I've ever caught in my life have been on the tube. Now it's generally dragging it or dead sticking it in shallow water and second would be the carolina rig in the river when there's current involved awesome let's let's break it down let's talk about tube fishing sure. you know 80 percent of the big fish that you catch comes from a tube is that what you said absolutely wow okay so and shallow or deep you mentioned uh, shallow but a mixture of both actually um early in the season they tend to be a lot shallower i shouldn't say that there is a lot of fish deep as well those big tanks, they're, they're shallow that first month of the season. There's And they're throughout the whole season, but generally the first month of the season, they're up in that four, five, six feet of water. And that's a lot of fun as well. Frustrating at times, but fun. All right, so are you visibly looking for, for cruising fish when you're throwing the tube, or are you blind casting? Uh, majority of the time, I'll, I'll physically look for them. Um, you eliminate a lot, a lot of time by cruising around and the things are so curious that you could drive the boat past them with the big motor, turn around, thrust her back up to them and catch them. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes it's just crazy. And other times they, they surprise you and they don't bite at all, but yeah, but majority of the times they're good, especially during the season before they start getting pressured. Uh, any particular size tube that you like to use or that you uh, tend to use more often? I, uh, I definitely, I'm, I'm a fan of the smaller profile tubes. Sometimes you, you, you throw a big tube at them and they don't want it. You kind of educate them right away. So I go skip right to the chase. I'll throw like a two and a half inch tube. Um, set the hook has a, has a really, really nice tube. It's 40% body, 60% tail. I like throwing it a lot. It's just a different profile. Those tentacles just go crazy. Um, mm -hmm. Even just dead sticking it, just the wave action or the current just gets those, those tentacles just moving. It's something about it that they like. So a lot of action. What What's your best, uh, if you had to pick, you know, two or three colors that you feel pretty good about that, that come in that tube, what what colors would it be? Uh, it's definitely the, the, the just the straight green pumpkin is probably my favorite. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. It's pretty common tube. It's pretty common color amongst most anglers. Um, Star Wars is another is another very unique one. I'm, I'm that guy that doesn't try to match the hatch like, most people would think you should. Um, just the goby population is so relevant and like it's so like populated with gobies. Mm -hmm. Sometimes throwing something that doesn't look like a goby works better. Yeah. Um, I always I always think of smallmouth as like a cat. They're very, very curious. They can't not ignore something for any length of time. But if if it looks so much like a goby, I think they do ignore it. 
more because it's at their beck and call anytime they want. They turn their head, there's a goby. They, they want to swim three feet, there's a goby. I'll throw something that's kind of off the wall, and then curiosity gets them to come over and have a look at it. And then, of course, they can't stare at it for that long without picking it up. That's an interesting point. I like that. I like that. I, I've always thought that you, you drop a camera down there and all you see is gobies everywhere. And it's like, how in the heck? Uh, that's one of the reasons I, I'm a big drop shotter. And I believe I believe having that, that leader a little bit longer, a foot and a half, two feet sometimes, allows that, whether it be a goby imitating bait or whatever you're using, to kind of stand out above the crowd of gobies on the bottom. Does that make sense? That's just kind of my theory. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you just got to do something a bit different than what they're used to seeing all the time. Right? Mm -hmm. Like I said, the curiosity gets them more than hunger or, you know, that th that feeling I should eat it. So living in living in Kingston, you know, you're right pretty much at the mouth of, of the St. Lawrence River as well as the main lake. Do you prefer the fish the lake over the river or is it a seasonal deal or if you had your choice or does it really not matter much to you? I, I I would say I like them both uh, equally. Uh, again, you know, the weather keeps me off the lake more days than I want to. You take advantage of the days when you can get out in the lake. But mm. for big fish, I feel that there's a bigger population of bigger fish in the lake. There is monsters in the river as well. But I think the population of bigger fish are in the lake. So Lenny, talk to me about Carolina rigging. You, you mentioned that's another one of your favorite techniques. I'm really curious about this because there's so many different uh, ways and every angler seems to have a different style or even down to the rod that they like to use when it comes to Carolina rigging. We could talk baits, we could talk setup, and I want to get into all of that. But I'm really curious, is that Carolina rig more of an application in the current in the river? And you're not going to throw it on the lake, or do you mess with it on the lake as well? Uh, I definitely use it more in the river than I would in the lake, uh, and use the current as your as as an advantage. Mm -hmm. um, but I have thrown it in the lake. You just have to create your own drift. More so in the river, though. I definitely I definitely prefer it there. You can cover a lot of work of water. Let the current be your friend, and and uh, mm -hmm. and the catch land ratio is is incredible with it. Let's first of all, let's talk about areas where you're going to throw a, a, a Carolina rig time of year. Is this something you're going to use right away uh, when they get a little bit deeper into the fall? Is this a year round application for you? Well, definitely early in the season. I don't throw it near as much um, just because they haven't dropped off into that, to those depths on some of the humps and the current breaks and stuff like that, that they are mid July on. You know, once they're done their their post spawn funk, they'll start moving deep, and they'll start picking them up. And then the fall, it's actually even better. What type of structure are you looking for when you're when you're Carolina rigging that in that midsummer? Are you are you often really deep, or uh, and then what is considered deep to you to use that rig? I've caught them probably. Uh, I average probably in that twenty five to thirty foot range as per normal, but I wouldn't even think twice of dropping down 45, 50, 55 feet. Um, just every day is different with those things. They, they just seem to want to move and figure them out that day. But yeah, 55 feet is probably as deep as I'd want to go. I don't like catching them into that depth. You pull them out of that depth. It's, you know, you gotta, you gotta take mm -hmm. care of those fish very, very well. To so as far as a Carolina rig setup, we got to talk baits, but I also got to, I, I'd love to know your, your setup as far as rod, reel, line. Um, can you walk me through that? Sure. Um, I surprise a lot of people when I, when I tell them the setup with the rod and reel and, and more so the line. Um, I, I throw it on a bait casting rod. I, I like uh, Halo's just come out with a really, really nice rod. It's XD3 Pro, super light rod. Uh, I use a seven foot two, medium heavy, um, seven to one gear ratio reel as mm -hmm. per normal i want to i want a pretty quick retrieve sometimes those things run at you towards the boat once you hook them you got to catch up to them um but I'll, i'm throwing i i don't finesse this whatsoever and this is what surprises a lot of people i'm throwing 40 pound braid to a barrel swivel to 20 or 25 pound fluorocarbon line wow um there's no like you don't need to finesse these things and what you're dragging through is the reason why i use the heavy line 
just you're pulling it through so much zebra mussels and rocks and crevices and all that stuff so you need some pretty hefty line to to keep them on and i just you know, any type of craw or swim bait or you know you kind of you can mix that up of what you're pulling behind biggest thing is making sure once you're pulling it it's not the bait's not consistently spinning or twisting you want something that glides through the water pretty good but um, and, and how do you find out? Uh, I mean, does that just come through with experience? Do you, do you tend to use a certain variety of baits um, as far as brands and things like that? I've been uh, actually I've been playing around with uh, uh, some of the swim baits from Netbait, uh, the the Spanky stuff like that. They they seem to work really well. The biggest thing is you got to make sure that you rig it on your hook like super super straight, so you don't get that twist, you don't get that wobble, the okay. wall line wobble I call it type thing. Yeah, and I'll just drag it beside the boat and see what it looks like. And that generally is what happens down below as well. So that's set up 50, 40 or 50 pound braid, did you say? 40? I use 40. 40 pound braid, 20 yeah. to 25 pound leader on the floral carbon. Uh, how long is a typical setup from the weight to the bait as far as your leader length? I let the fish tell me that day, but I generally start in that 30, 36 inch mark okay um right around there and sometimes they want it really close and i think sometimes what's happening is that that weight's bouncing off a of bottom and that attracts the fish and if your bait's too far away from the weight you might not trigger that fish to bite the bait so sometimes i want it closer i've i've dragged them you know as close as probably 12 14 inches and it's worked as well what is going to be your weight uh typical size of a weight that you're going to use and that'll depend on on the depth and the current wind speed all that kind of stuff the faster you're going the little bit heavier you want to go the depth is is huge parts of the saint lawrence river most of the time that current's in that 1.7 to two mile an hour range you get down below the cornwall dam in lake saint francis i'm not sure if you're aware of there but the current there's sometimes it's four or five miles an hour and the smallmouth living in there and uh i'll throw up to two ounces of egg sinkers just to, just to get it down and maintain bottom contact that's a good tip right there because you mentioned depending on what part of the saint lawrence river you're fishing uh you know down below lake saint francis on that pool uh wicked current big time good point get that weight a little bit heavier heaviest you can i, I always say as heavy as you get away with you know you can still feel bottom and, and maintain good contact for someone that's just starting out uh, Carolina rig and they they want to want to utilize this technique maybe a little bit more what size would you recommend if you're in that 25 to 30 foot range of as far as depth uh, normal current not too much wind what's probably the best uh, weight that you would recommend I generally don't go anything less than one ounce but usually in that depth range ounce and a quarter is kind of where I'm at I let, I prefer actually throwing a tungsten weight on top of that Sure, uh, sure. Throw an ultra tungsten uh, punch weight is what I like to throw. A little bit of a tapered head, so it kind of glides through the rocks a little bit better. Doesn't hang up as much, but that tungsten, it really, it, it's incredible in how much difference it makes when you're dragging through. I can feel it like hitting rock, 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 and all of a sudden it's just dragging on bottom. I just hit a sand patch, and that those transitions are are the spots where those fish like to hang out. As soon as I feel that that sand patch, it's almost you can almost call it. Like if you're on, if you know you're on fish, it's just a matter of time. All of a sudden, there's weight there. You set the hook and you reel it in. It's 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 incredible. You don't feel that with the lead. You just don't feel it. Your typical retrieve Carolina rigging on the river. Are you drifting it, or are you actually physically making casts and working that bait while you're drifting, or are you controlling the boat, or is it a variety? I would say it's definitely a variety. Uh, majority of the time, I'm just letting the current get on a current seam. Uh, and there's a seam for a reason because there's something different on the bottom that's creating that seam or the current uh, bounces off a certain object or something like that. But I generally, uh, I'll drift with the current. The odd time we'll sit, we'll call it a, a, a pool or, or slack water and we'll actually throw it out and let the current work the, the bait down. And that's really, really hard to detect bites, but uh, it is very effective at times. You know, when you're in 25, 30 feet of water, you got an ounce and a quarter weight, you got 40 pound braid, you got your 20, 25 pound fluorocarbon leader, and you get that bite. How are you setting the hook? Is it a typical Carolina rig hook set with that setup? 
It's uh, all depends again if if the current's pretty strong. Uh, a lot of times the fish are hooking themselves, and I'll just tighten up. But if if the current's a little bit weaker in that one one and a half mile an hour range, I jam them. I, I jam them hard. I mean, like I said, there's really there's not a real a whole lot of finesse to this, but it's it's a it's a money technique. It's a tournament technique that most tournament anglers don't want to fight. Right? They want to put that fish in the boat, let them fight in the live well. So yeah, I jam them pretty hard, and and that rod and reel combo is it's it's a winch. Just get mm. them in, get them to the boat. So yeah, it's easier I mean, on the fish too. Less stress on the fish when when they're not putting all their effort into staying away from you. No, this is fascinating. Like, like I I know you catch big smallmouth. I know guys that that focus on on Carolina rigging. Uh, I'm just fascinated because for me it's one of my weaknesses, and I've said this before in the past only because I don't throw it as often as I probably should. It, it's uh, it's a technique that's always, you know guys are catching them on it, but for me, I've just, I gotta force myself to use yeah. it. So uh, you really nailed it as far as the setup. Yeah, for people that are looking at experimenting with this type of style of fishing for smallmouth, I mean, you opened my eyes to some ideas, you know, that I, I assume that 40 pound braid really allows you to get a little bit better uh, control of your bait Feel of the bottom versus fluorocarbon, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. How, I think that's key. And, and how often are you retying that? Uh, <laughs> quite a few times during the day. Are you are you just breaking off? Are you breaking off at the leader? Yeah. Prior to the weight. In a in an average tournament, we'll call we'll we'll just use Lake St. Francis for example. I'll have eight rods rigged up with it, and I probably retie those three to four times a day so i'm like 25 to 30 times a day wow. i'm retying um just because of the, the rock and all that stuff there's a lot of sharp stuff down there uh, i don't take any chances i get a little nick in there obviously you know you retire you pick up another rod keep that bait in the water but mm -hmm. uh yeah we re you do have to retie a lot uh-huh are you an extra wide gap hook uh, angler or do you like a straight shank when you're rigging those plastics or does well, it depend on the plastics yeah, it all depends what plastic I'm using. It will determine the hook I'm using. If it's a fairly hefty bait, definitely I'll go to a wide gap. Or, you know, if it's a fairly thin, I want to I, – I, I prefer the straight shank hook because it does, doesn't does hook up or doesn't snag up near as much on bottom. But if the bait doesn't allow me to use it, I'll, I'll go to a wide gap. Okay. And what do you have a recommendation as far as uh, what hooks you would recommend people try if they were getting into this technique as far as round bend? I, I literally just use, like you said, like I'm, I'm a Gamagatsu fan. I prefer okay. Gamis, just a, a wide gap uh, worm hook or, or their straight shanks series. Or the odd time I'll use the trocar, they, they work well too. So Wow, good stuff, man. Uh, Carolina rigging, throwing the tube. What are some weaknesses, man? I know you know how to catch them, but is there th do you have some issues like me? Like I'd love to learn how to throw a Carolina rig. What are some baits that you know work, but you just don't use that often? I really have to sharpen up on my Ned rig. I oh, yeah? I really wow. do. I do. I, I just, in the back of my head, I always think that the tube will catch them just as much as a Ned, but I know that's not the case because, you know, I fish with people that are throwing the Ned rig when I think I can get them on the tube and they're slamming them. So I just a little pig-headed. I go back to it. But mm -hmm. catching my personal best on a tube kind of, you know, it, it makes you think, okay, this is the deal. But I'm yeah, a versatile right. angler, but... I get pig-headed at times. So. I get it. I definitely get that. So speaking of uh, personal best, what is your personal best smallmouth? Uh, two years ago, September September of 2019, um, I, I launched my absolute best, eight-pound, six-pound smallmouth. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. By Come myself, on. which was the heartbreaker because yeah, it was eight? pretty incredible. Let's just call eight and a half. Yeah. Eight and a half pound smallmouth on Lake Ontario. Yes, Lake Ontario. Wow. Yeah, I caught the thing. I was on the phone with a buddy of mine. It just bulldog didn't want to jump. Sun was in my eyes. There's a ripple on the water. Couldn't see what it was when it came to the surface. Get it to the boat, and I'm I just like oh, I think all of Kingston heard me uh, yell and scream. <laughs> but wow. yeah, it was incredible. Yeah, that I is that is the beast. Facebook. Put a post on facebook to see if anybody was downtown working meet me at a dock for pictures and i was lucky enough uh, queen's university they have a bio department 
that they uh, do all kinds of uh, studies on smallmouth. A good friend of mine, Bruce Tuff, is a professor there. Gave him a call and he sent some sample or students down for uh, scale samples and a weight and length and all that verification and which is awesome because they were able to take it back to the lab and do studies on it. And they've never been able to do one on a fish that size before. So. Oh, very cool. Did really they give perfect. you any feedback on that as far as maybe the age and of that fish? Yeah, they give me as much feedback as they possibly can with the scale sample. But uh, up until about 11 or 12 years old, the scale, they can read the age off a of scale. But after that, unfortunately, the fish has to be deceased. Hmm. So they couldn't give me an age, but... Well, we know it was at least 12 years old, but yeah. Bruce was kind of thinking it's probably closer to that 19, 20 year old mark. Wow. So you might have had, if that was in the U.S. side, that would have been a state record. I believe it was. Um, oh, I geez. was I was happier to get that fish let go swimming back into the water than mm -hmm. worry about the record thing. Sure. I don't, I don't need the, I don't need that. Like if it was a tournament by all means, yes. But mm -hmm. um, I was more concerned to seeing that fish swim away than, than worry about that. But I mean, I got verification from the, from Queens and on uh, my scale and give or take an ounce or two, who knows? I don't know, but sure. big fish. <laughs> it is, it is extremely successful. You've been at 30 plus years, you know, on the tournament scene. What drives you as far as uh, chasing these smallmouth in tournaments? learning learning something new every day i i i have a saying a day on the water with nothing learned is a wasted day and i and i go by that i just love to to learn different things different different locations different techniques except for ned rig of course but <laughs> but uh yeah that that drives me just to learn every day i want to learn something new so as far as some of your memorable tournaments what would uh at the top of your head what are some some tournaments that you've either done well in or you've won or that were just special that that stand out in your mind uh one that comes to my mind every time i'm asked this is uh the canadian open uh 2015 i believe it was just a little bit of background probably prior to that tournament i was never really a, a smallmouth angler i i really love my green fish i love the largemouth i spent all my time and and really up until then the largemouth actually I wouldn't say dominated, but it was right there all the time. And I just love to fish them. But then this whole goby thing started coming along and the smallmouth getting bigger. And I'm like, okay, I got to figure these smallmouth out. So uh, two or three years prior to the, the, the Canadian Open, I just started spending lots of time on Lake Ontario. I figured, okay, it's time to, to sign up for the tournament. Um, and the, and the, the Canadian Open, that's all the big sticks in, in Ontario and, and New York State came to fish this. Um, wasn't a huge field, but it, the field was stacked. Definitely big sticks. You know, the Johnstons, uh, Derek Strube, uh, JP, you know, the, all D Dave Chong, the whole works, they're all there, Doug Brownridge. So I figured, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how I, I fare out. And, and that tournament stands out a lot because uh, I found the spot the year prior um, because I knew the tournament was going to be in August. So I figured, okay, Lake Ontario in August, the fish are in transition. They're not quite shallow anymore. They're not really where they want to be. They're kind of moving. So I, I spent some time in, in on the lake to try to figure them out. And I found the spot was just like incredible the year before. So I'm thinking, okay, the, the weekend of the tournament, I go out there and it's a pro-am event. So uh, I got a, a co-angler in the boat with me and, and uh, we pull up to the spot. I said to him, I want to catch six or seven fish off this spot. And that's it. If they're if they're the fish that I think are here, we don't have to because it's a three day event. So I don't think we have to catch any more than that. I, we caught seven fish. I had twenty four and a quarter in probably an hour, hour and a half. So I said to Tom, my co angler, said, "Okay, let's go pre fishing for the rest of the weekend." We left the spot alone. Day two got canceled because of winds. There's 10 uh -huh. footers ro rolling through the lake, which happens out there a lot. So, again, the weather protects that body now, of water. Now, let me ask you, did you, when you had that 24-pound bag fairly early and you decided to go pre-fish, were you aware of what was going to happen the next day with the big winds, or was it something that wasn't forecasted? It was definitely forecasted, and that's why I pre-fished in the river for day two. But the winds were so strong, they had uh, small craft warning down the river as well. So they had to cancel day two. Okay. Um, 
I was prepared to go down the river and do my Carolina rig thing or, or drop shot tube, all that kind of stuff. But then they canceled it, which was a disappointment because I feel that I could have done quite well down there as well. But it, it's, that's, that's the way it goes, safety first. So uh, Day three rolled around. I said, okay, I'm going to go back out to this spot. took us an hour to get to it because it was still a lot of residual waves from, from the day before. There's five-foot rollers out there. Not waves, rollers. So they're, it's manageable. We get to the spot and first fish of the first cast of the day, four and a half pounder. It's a good grade on there here. So we start working around 20 minutes, 25 minutes, not another tap. Uh-huh. Doesn't seem like a long time, but in that spot, that's a long time because the fish were just stacked. The, my fish finder was just going berserk. They were there mm-hmm. the first day out there. And so I figured, okay, I'll start with that again. Switched it up to a tube and let the wave action and, and the weather to use it to my advantage. 20 minutes, I had 28 pounds, 2805, I think it was in the boat, 20 minutes. Like, it was, it was just nuts. It, I'm, at this point, it's nuts. So what happened? Was it the, the technique you switched over or? What? I strongly, yeah, I strongly believe it was the technique. For some reason, they just, they didn't want the drop shot. I And I very rarely see that out there where that many numbers of fish refuse a bait completely right so like the competition factor with smallmouth that's that's i find that's use it to your advantage the more fish the better you can throw anything at them it's now it's a competition for them to to eat your bait but for some reason they just wanted something dragging on bottom crazy a lot of people would have bailed yeah you know what i mean they would have they would have left but you stayed you put 28 pounds in the boat now at what at what moment do you realize you got a good shot here? I need to get back in, or what was going through your mind the rest of the day? Yeah, it was funny because uh, I had to call out that four and a half pounder, so we just drifted off the spot because I don't like letting the, my smallmouth go in, in schools. Like if I'm pulling one out of live well, I don't like to let it go in school because I've seen it shut them down. Um, it might be a myth, but whatever, it's confidence in my head. Get rid of it. Mm-hmm. So we drifted off. My co-angler says, so what are we going to do now? I said, we're going to go back up and see if we can call a couple. <laughs> wow. And uh, we went back up and we literally caught three or four 25-pound bags that we didn't need. Five-pounders, high fours, low fives. I needed a five. I think a 540 was my small fish. I needed something better than that. And I couldn't beat it. I was getting 525s, 530s, 515s, 495s. It was just nuts, like three or four 25 pound bags that we didn't need. And like, and then the wind started kicking up. I said, you know what? Tim was my co-angler. I said, let's start heading back to Kingston. Uh, we'll take care of these fish. We stopped every 10 minutes, give them a fresh drink, you know, mm-hmm. how to drink ourselves, relax. I'm shaking at this point. This is a big tournament, sure. like I said, big sticks, you know, Chris and Corey, you know, how, how do you, you know, those right. guys, they're, they're machines, they're animals. So, and at this point, I still don't know if I'm going to, win this event not fishing against those guys i was in fourth i think going in this the, the last day with okay pounds. uh chris was leading i think he had 26 and change um so i knew i wasn't done but i have lots of spots close to kingston and pulled up to a, a deep boulder mark two fish on it two five and a quarters like back, to back that i don't need <laughs> i mean I, my day is going quite well if i don't need five and a quarter so uh-huh it's it was just an incredible day yeah that's that's an awesome story i mean who who knew that's uh there's some lessons to be learned there switching techniques that you know if you know the fish are there trying to figure out a way to get them to 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 bite i love the fact that once you knew you had a good weight on day one it's time to practice based on the conditions for the next day you know a lot of people seems like just myself in general I have all these great plans of doing this or doing that, and I'm struggling all day to put five good ones in the boat. And then, and then, you know, then you try to figure out what you do with an hour left before you have to go in. But to have to have a good bag like that and to just go out and look for new water, that's a luxury a lot of anglers don't get during tournament day, you know. That's um, right. That's right. That, that's awesome. A, a couple other quick questions here. I, I know we're running out of time, but this is really good. Uh, information so far. I know I'm excited. I'm going to probably, because of this conversation, I'm going to have a Carolina rig in my hand more often now. So uh, I, I hope the uh, the listeners are appreciative of this as well. But if I could say you have only one bait to use 
next year. And that's it. One bait all year long to catch smallmouth. What bait's that going to be? I think I already know the answer for you. If it's an all year thing, uh, starting from the beginning to the end, I, I have to go with the tube. It's going to be I a tube. I really do. I really do. The Carolina rig is awesome. It's mm -hmm. just not good for that first two, three, four weeks of the season. And, and I don't want them to be fishless. So, but right? the tube will catch them all year. The so. tube's very, very versatile. Set the hook tube, is that it? And what was that called again? It's a set the hook tube, yeah. The uh, just the green pumpkin and Star Wars are probably my two favorite. Yes. They, they have they have a copper flake tube that, that is pretty incredible on the right day. Cloudy days, I like throwing it at times. I let the fish tell me what, what color to, to throw. Uh -huh. Just because it's my favorite doesn't mean it's the one I'm going to throw. I let the fish tell me. And I use that for a lot of, a lot of things. People say, well, what color do, do you use? Well, let the fish tell you what color to use. So I, I keep a wide variety of colors in my boat. I'm not that guy that, that has to have every single color. I, I like shades rather than the specific colors. I'll just go from one shade of color to the next. Yeah, and keep, sometimes keep I'll go stuff. to something right off the wall, like crazy color. Yeah. And it works. So you're not carrying a whole bunch of tackle with you. You got things kind of, as far as colors, everything is pretty much picked. Let the fish decide. I mean, of course you don't. You, you got... You got all that one ounce and two ounce tungsten that you're you're breaking off on all day. You got enough weight in your boat as it is. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what do you think separates yourself from some of the top anglers? Um, you know, when it comes to smallmouth fishing, uh, day in and day out, being able to put good fish in the boat, the experience, the knowledge that you have. Uh, you know, what what separates you from some of the other anglers out there? Uh, like I said, I'm very very fortunate with my shift at work. I can put so much time on water. Time on the water. Yeah. And that's a key, big time. The, the, there's a lot of anglers that don't have that opportunity. They're, they're amazing anglers. And if they had that time, they're just going to be that much better. Yeah, time on the water, for sure. Right. And don't be afraid to learn. Try different things. Learn, 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 learn. Some well, of the worst stuff. days I've ever had on the water are the, the days I learned the most. Well, good stuff, Lee. How can people follow you if they want to keep up with what you're doing? Uh, do you have any presence as far as on social media and things like that? I have uh, Facebook myself, just under Lenny DeVos. I don't uh, don't carry a fishing page, but I try to post, you know, a lot of things on that Instagram as well. So awesome, awesome. And it's uh, K Town Fire for Instagram. It's truly one of the best, amazing fisheries and just gorgeous place to uh, to fish for these magnificent fish. I mean, eight pounds six ounce lives there. We know that much. Yeah, I would have loved to seen that thing the end of October. Ah, oh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome, Lane. Thanks again for coming on. This has been awesome. I, I certainly appreciate your knowledge, and especially when it comes to Carolina rigging, throwing the tube, man. Uh, you're welcome back anytime. Appreciate it. Thank you. And as always, guys, until next time, we'll see you on the water. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.